and Port Arthur was a bold social experiment in the treatment of convicted criminals. It was designed along the lines of a giant machine, and we can thank Jeremy Bentham for this machine. A noted philosopher and social reformer, he had the wonderful idea that it should be possible to reform men while you were punishing them. For that end, he designed what he called a mill to grind rogues honest. And this miller machine operated on five main cogs. Surveillance, discipline and punishment, classification and separation, seven classes of male convicts, and each class kept separate from the other. The only female convicts that came to Port Arthur came as assigned servants to families that wasn't a prison for females. Now thrown into this reforming mix were two extra cogs, ones we can lay directly at the feet of Jeremy Bentham. Education, which included trade training, and religious coercion. I'll explain that a little more fully later on. These rogues, or convicts, came from all over the British Empire, but mostly from the United Kingdom. Convicted and sentenced to transportation, they went to Sydney or Hobart, and if they re-offended, they were forwarded on to Port Arthur. This was a secondary prison. This site was chosen for a number of reasons. One was geography. When you look around, we're in a sort of a fruit bowl here, and this allowed for some important things to happen. The military men could build a garrison over there on the hillside. Typical British garrison, much easier to defend if the attackers have to run uphill. It also allowed those of high social status to build their housing across there on the hillside. They could look down on those that had low or no social status. Well, that sounds a bit familiar. One side of the fruit bowl is open. There we have a deep sheltered harbour that is just 42 nautical miles from Hobart, which made communication by sea fairly easy, 8 to 10 hours sailing time under good conditions. And because we're relatively close to Hobart, across the hilltops run a semaphore system. On a clear day, using a numerical code, they can get a message to Hobart inside 15 minutes. If you want to compare technologies, if you've got a mobile phone and you're not with Telstra, you can't communicate the length of the parade ground. There were some other advantages too. If you look up on the hillside, you can see a lot of hardwood timber, second and third regrowth. The original would have come right down to the high water mark. Plenty of fresh water. We get 46 inches, which is over 1,400 millimetres of rain a year here, and that's more than adequate by Tasmanian standards. And to cap it off, the Tasman Peninsula is a natural prison. To escape by land, and few convicts could swim, they had to cross Eagle Hawk Neck. There, there were 25 soldiers and up to 15 of the ugliest brutes you ever laid eyes on. Dogs, not soldiers. And they were chained so the two could eat from the same dish, but they couldn't get close enough to fight. Anyone stop at Eagle Hawk Nick? Have a look at the bronze dog mark the side of the dog like. He's got a face that only a mother could love. Looks worse when the local lads put a bit of roadkill in his mouth too. Not everyone's amused by that. Now, over the 47 years this was a penal settlement, Almost 13,000 sentences were served here by somewhere between six and 7,000 men. The records are good, but not totally perfect. As well as convicts, we had military men, detachments of various British regiments. The symbol of military power on site and the engine room to our machine starts with a white cottage on the cr cross there on the point, comes around to the little orange cottage on the, with the tin roof. It starts at the road and goes to the top of the hill. The white cottage is the commandant's cottage. I call it the house that grew. The first part was built in 1833 for Charles O'Hara Booth, commandant of the day, arguably the most influential man in the development of Port Arthur. He was a bachelor and a four-roomed hut was quite adequate for his needs. He got married in 1838 and by 1840 the first extensions had been completed. Each commandant made his own changes over the years and by the time the settlement closed in 1877 it had become quite a substantial house. By 1895, it was a 21-room private hotel. It's been restored and interpreted across its history, a fascinating place to look through. Each room tells the story of a different part of the house's history. It's open till 5 o'clock. There's an information officer up there with a dual role. One is to answer questions. The other one is to make sure that you don't walk out with a 200-year-old clock under your arm. If you like antique furniture, we have some beautiful samples on site. Coming round a little, you can see the guard tower, the symbol of surveillance. The orange cottage with the tin roof was a pair of conjoined officers' units. One of those two units is open, and inside is a model of the military area as it was in 1870. And if you look at that model, you'll realise that 80% of Port Arthur's buildings have gone. Recycled, demolished, burnt out in the bushfires of 1895-1897. Two that were demolished were the soldiers' barracks they built up on top of the hill from the ordinary soldiers. 
the state government, having closed the site in 1877, subdivided it and then auctioned it off in 1884, when condition of sale for the soldiers' barracks was that they be demolished and the material removed from the site. They wanted to wipe the stain of convictism from the face of Tasmania. The men who lived in those barracks were the other ranks, anyone below the rank of Sergeant Major. And for every hundred of those men, twelve were allowed to bring their wives, as long as they were ladies of the finest quality, that means in character, and they were prepared to help with the work of the regiment. Now we know growing older is compulsory, growing up is optional, just look at some of our sportsmen. Some of these young soldiers may well have needed a mother figure. The ladies were expected to fulfil that role. As well, they had to help with the cooking, the cleaning, the mending, the sewing. Come on, ladies, you've got to help me with this. You get the idea. They had to do their work under the supervision of the sergeant major's wife. And if she was as lovely as the average sergeant major, it must have been a real pleasure. But they did get one special privilege. The single men had no privacy. In their dormitory, it was just a great long open row of beds. In the married dormitory, they did have privacy. There was a curtain between each of the beds. Down below the guard tower was the Commandant's office, where he, or the office of the day, would hand out punishments to misbehaving convicts. And this is probably where the weak point in the system was, in that the men in charge of the work gangs, the overseers, were often ex-convicts, or even still convicts themselves. And give a man a position of power, he's likely to abuse it. That hasn't changed too much over the years either. We'd probably think of some of these charges as being a bit on the trivial side. Insolence, failure to work out, losing part of your clothing, of course, there were more serious offences, like threatening behaviour or assault, but if it was really serious and might result in capital punishment, they were sent to Hobart for trial. Henry Belfield, nearly 16 years old, committed murder here, taken to Hobart, a two-day trial, found guilty on the 20th of January, and on the 2nd of February, courtesy of the noose, he was launched into eternity. There were no executions in Port Arthur, but they had some interesting punishments. Now imagine losing one of your two blankets for a week. How'd you got on last night in the drafting door, <coughs> lying on your bunk, one thin blanket over your shoulders, trying to keep you warm? What would you be thinking about? Your behaviour or the person who put you up on the charts? Don't answer that, it might get you into trouble. They used reclassification. In the flat area across the way there were gardens. Men worked there without chains. Offend an overseer, you're up on a charge. Next thing you're in a timber gang. Much harder work and six kilo chain attached to your ankles. They used their stomachs and put a man on half rations for a week. But his stomach told him to behave himself. Solitary confinement. William Jupp, caught eating a raw turnip when he was supposed to be gardening, was given three days solitary confinement on bread and water. I'd have given him three days on turnip and water, that would have killed him. They also used corporal punishment, but I'll talk about that a little later on. Let's head along this way now as we go. Just watch out um, for the wallaby droppings, they're everywhere. But uh, also cast an eye over the big building there, see if you can work out what trades would have been required for its construction. Anyway, when Port Arthur first opened in 1830, the actual shoreline of this bay was about here where the road is. And this area behind me was a muddy mess. Commandant Booth hated untidiness, he decided to reclaim it. He, um, they didn't have bobcats in those days, in fact he wasn't even allowed beasts of burden. They weren't allowed on the peninsula till the mid-1850s. So this area was actually reclaimed by men with wheelbarrows, picks and shovels. And it provided a parade ground for soldiers, a sea wall they could build their wharves out from, and flatten out the air in front of the large building. That was built in the early 1840s as a granary, a place to store wheat. It incorporated a flour mill to grind the wheat into flour. That was powered by a water wheel. The dam in the hills, water channeled and piped, turned the big water, water wheel to turn the grindstones. It lacked enough power, especially in summer, and they had to find a supplementary source. You know the treadmills they used to exercise mice? They put something like that in there, on a much larger scale, anywhere between 18 and, 20 and 48 men in it, in chains, eight, eight hours of the day. But they did give them a break for lunch. It wasn't a success, first to the lack of power on the water wheel, but also the Tasman Peninsula is not really suited to growing grain. By the early 1850s it had actually fallen into disuse. Then they heard that the convict settlement on Norfolk Island was to close. All the convicts were to be brought to Port Arthur. The convict accommodation here had been built in the early 1830s from split green timber. It was getting dilapidated, had earthen floors and was certainly overcrowded. The decision was made to convert our granary to a penitentiary. It went from grinding wheat to grinding rogues. And in the conversion, it became a symbol of the classification system. 
ground floor and first floor had a total of 136 single cells, meaning heavy chains on the ground floor, lighter chains on the first floor. The second floor was a mess hall where they ate, a library and a Roman Catholic chapel. The top floor was a dormitory where around 480 men could sleep, hopefully with the windows open. The main meal of the day was bread, salt, meat, potato, turnip and cabbage. But anyone who was resident in there could get free education. It was provided two nights a week in the mess hall. At that stage in the United Kingdom, basic education wasn't freely available to the working classes. For many, it was their first opportunity to get the basics of reading and writing. And for those that could read, they had a library. By 1870, the convict's library contained over 13,000 volumes of morally uplifting reading material. I don't think there was too much in the Mills and Boone style. But a very important part of their education program was trade training. The building stands as a monument to trades taught here. 864,000 handmade bricks went into that building, all made here in Port Arthur. Stone cut in local quarries, bricklaying, stone masonry taught. All the timber trades, from rough sawing through to cabinet making and joinery. Iron came in as pig iron in ships where a foundry and blacksmith shop. They would have made fittings. There was a tannery that provided leather for the leather trades and boot making was important. Their workshops ran from the end of the penitentiary up into that corner. There was a tram track came past the front of the workshops so they could pick up manufactured items and cart it through the musty yard in front of the penitentiary to the store sheds down by the wharves where it could be stored prior to being shipped out. The creek across there was covered over with planks, so you could walk across it, and just behind me here is where the big saw pits and the tannery used to be. But these weren't the only workshops in Port Arthur. About 200 metres past where the boat goes from are the dockyards, established in 1834 and operated for 15 years. You can walk around there, there's some, uh, in, some uh, infrastructure left and there's an audio interpretation installed. But there are also workshops on that finger of land that runs out into the bay towards the little island. And uh, that was the site of the first juvenile prison in the British Empire. It opened in 1834 and operated for 15 years. In that time, around 3,000 boys passed through it, most of them between 13 and 17. We have got records of nine-year-olds out there. But it was more than just a prison. With good behaviour, good attitudes, they were given the opportunity for self-improvement. Some 20 trades were taught out there. They also had four nights a week of an hour or so of schooling in the four R's. Reading, writing, taught with biblical passages, so they got religion and a smattering of arithmetic. John Hughes, a 13-year-old, wrote obscene words in school. His punishment? 48 hours solitary confinement on bread and water. Something to make teachers jealous today. Hmm. But for all their work sites, there were no such thing as occupational health and safety standards. You're bound to get accidents. For accidents, you need a hospital. And up there on top of the hill with the three archways is the third hospital built in Port Arthur. It's a beautiful building, but it was poorly ventilated and certainly didn't have the standards of hygiene we would expect today. Only convicts and common soldiers were treated up there. Civil officers, military officers and their families were treated in their own homes. If you're a bit weak in the stomach, you'd better cover your ears for a minute. I'm going to tell you a gruesome story. Edward Howard, convict, tried to escape. He was shot through the upper arm and the bullet smashed the bone. He's got two choices. Die from loss of blood or go to the hospital and, have a, and risk an amputation. Up he went. Surgeon Casey got three strong men to hold him down on the table, dislocated his shoulder and then performed the amputation at the socket. Now Commandant Booth wrote in his journal that he'd been present through the entire operation, which had taken almost ten minutes. The prisoner Howard had well, didn't have to muck about with the anaesthetist, you see. The prisoner Howard had taken his amputation manfully and appeared to be doing well. You think that means he'd stopped screaming but he was still breathing. He lived on. Two weeks after his amputation, they sent him back to work as an example to other convicts. And he lived on for nearly nine more years before he made his final voyage to that little island out in the bay. That is our convict period cemetery. We know of at least 1,100 burials on that island. The pattern of burials reflects the social structure here in Port Arthur. Three people, up on the hillside, up the top end. They could have whatever grave furnishings their families could afford and they're still looking down on convicts, paupers, lunatics and point poor boys buried in unmarked graves on the lower side. Now, when Port Arthur first opened in 1830, the actual uh, well, 16 military men brought 35 convicts here, and their job was to cut timber for Hobart. 
Quickly they realised the potential of the site. By 1833 to become a maximum security prison, there were now 230 convicts here, and the original bark huts down that were inadequate, so they terraced this area behind me and built their huts on that. The huts were arranged around two courtyards and a big log fence around the outside. After the settlement closed in 1877, these huts, along with other wooden buildings on site, became a target for the recyclers, and what they left behind were burnt out in bushfires of 1895-1897. The Weatherboard Cottage there was built in 1936 as a police station to deter further vandalism. You can still see his little guest house out the back. The front two rooms contain a display about our ongoing archaeological program here. Well worth a visit. Behind where that house stands is where the first welfare system started in the state. By the 1850s around the state there were a lot of men broken psychologically. They could no longer look after themselves, their life skills had deserted them. Family and community support was back in the United Kingdom. Somebody had to take responsibility, so the state government gathered up those that weren't already in Port Arthur and brought them here. A new barracks was built there where they put what they referred to as the useless old men. Now, ladies, I have to tell you, that term went out of usage here in 1877 and is not to be revived. The brick ruin over the back there is the paupers or invalids mess. That's where they were fed and where on Sunday evenings people put on little entertainments for the old gentlemen or the old crawlers, whichever epithet they preferred. The flat area behind you is gardens. Men working there, if they turned their back on the symbol of military power towards the commandant's house, were confronted by the symbol of spiritual power up there on the hill. They were reminded God was watching most of the stone for that church was actually cut by the boys on Point Poor learning the stonemasons' crafts. A lot of the wooden fittings were done in the carpentry shops on Point Poor, so the boys had quite an input into its construction. Unfortunately, in 1884, the man that had bought the parsonage was burning rubbish in his yard. A spark got on the dry wooden shingle roof of the church, and within a few hours the whole thing was totally gutted. But it was the first brick and stone building completed in Port Arthur. Governor Arthur, like a good evangelical Christian, came down to officially open it. From the pulpit, he declared, No man can be truly considered reformed until he has embraced the word of the Lord. So that's why twice on a Sunday, the convicts were lined up by armed guards, marched by armed guards to the church. They filed in and sat on pews on the floor of the church with armed guards all round. Religious coercion. There was tiered seating at the sides for the free people, civil officers, military men and the convicts, uh, military men and their families. Between them and the convicts hung a Hessian screen, one to stop convicts leering at the wives and daughters of the free, but also, if I can use the terms of the times, to save those ladies from having their vision offended by having to gaze down on those degraded brutes on the floor of the church below. The church was never consecrated to any one denomination. They wanted all men to be able to worship together. And this worked reasonably well, till the Reverend Edward Durham arrived. A difficult man to get on at the best of times, he was known amongst the other officers as that man Durham. And if he was bad, his wife was worse. She had a scandalous tongue and a vicious nature. Commandant Courtney is reputed to have said that he felt he could do away with solitary confinement. It would be harsh to give a man two weeks' service in the past nature. They must have been an interesting couple. Durham was an Irish Protestant, a few fiery sermons from him, along the lines of, and one actually entitled, The Sin of Being a Roman Catholic, and 185 men refused to go to church, the Irish Catholics. The Commandant realised that if he tried to force them to go to church, he'd have a mutiny on his hands. Within two weeks he organised a Catholic catechist here, within two months a full Roman Catholic chaplain who initially used the church at his own convenience, but when the penitentiary alteration had been completed, he had his own Roman Catholic chapel in there, advanced thinking in the British public service of the time. The church is still used occasionally. Just after Easter this year, a young man got a life sentence up there. Bridesmaids were gorgeous. The <laughs> avenue of oaks that leads up to the church were planted in 1838, and on the far side of the government gardens, established in the 1840s, a place where the civil officers and their families could relax, socialise, get away from the feeling of being locked in a maximum security prison. In reality, those ladies were just as much prisoners as the men in the cells. The gardens were rebuilt in the 1990s and every effort made to get them as authentic as they possibly could.
Now, initially the officers built wooden housing on Settlement Hill, that's up around the hospital. But into the 1840s, they started to build more substantial brick housing in what we call Civil Row. Top right-hand side, we have the Parsonage. It was built in the early 1840s. By the 1870s, it had a reputation as one of the most haunted houses in Australia. Still listed in the top ten. It's a feature stop on our historic ghost tours. Now, if you'd like 90 minutes of memorable experience, bookings are essential. All you need are strong shoes, warm clothes, and if you haven't got a strong heart, take your tablet before you go. But, so, the building is uh, also open until 5 o'clock tonight. It was the local post office from the 1890s through to about 1970. Next door to it, we've got the accountant's house, the man who held the purse strings. We open that between 11 and 4 during school holidays. We have children's activities running up there. Across the road, we come to the junior medical officer's house, the prettiest house on site. Completed in March 1848 for Thomas and Charlotte Montier and their 11 children. It's been restored as we think it would have been when Dr Brownell and his wife and six of their 13 children lived there. It's got some beautiful furniture in it, but the real feature of the house is the joinery work. It's done in Tasmanian blackwood, and we claim you won't find finer examples of convict craftsmanship in timber anywhere in Australia than what you find up there in that house. It's open till 5 o'clock. Again, there's an information officer up there with a dual role. Answer questions. Make sure you don't walk out with an antique human pine wardrobe hidden under your jacket. Next door, we have the Roman Catholic chaplain's house. There is another one in the line, the Senior Surgeon or Visiting Magistrate's House. Neither open to the public. You are welcome to have a look in the gardens or peep in the windows if you wish. Initially, the... Um, oh, sorry, before... The little grey cottage here on the flat relates to the Carnarvon period. Now, Port Arthur closed 1877. By 1884, it had developed into a fishing and farming village. They wanted to forget the convict past, so they changed the name to Carnarvon. But by 1927, they'd realised they might be quitting tourism, so they changed it back again. That particular house stands over the site of one burnt out in a bushfire in 1895. It's been restored as a 1915 man, working man's cottage. It's, uh, I walk through it, as I will later on this evening when I lock up, and um, it, remind, it makes me stop and think. This is probably how my grandmother used to live. Up on top of the hill, we've got uh, another little cottage with a steeply sloping roof. It was built initially as a stable. But it had many uses in convict times, and its claim to fame is that it housed our most famous convict, William Smith O'Brien, an Irish political prisoner sent here. If you've got time and energy to make it to the top of the hill before five o'clock, you'll get information about Smith O'Brien and other members of the Young Islander movement, about um, Zephaniah Williams and other members of the English Chartist movement, about uh, Linus Miller and other members of the Free Canada movement, all of whom came here as, as political prisoners. The bottom layer in the terracing was a flagellation yard where corporal punishment was administered. All the convicts were assembled to watch. It was meant to act as a deterrent. The man to be punished was stripped to the waist, had his hands tied up to a wooden triangle to stretch the muscles in his back, and he was whipped with a cat of nine times. A uh, wooden handle, nine strands of cord, nine, uh, uh, nine knots in each cord. Each, uh, uh, con well, it only took two strokes to start lifting the skin from the back, and uh, convicts could get up to a hundred lashes. But the forward thinkers of the 1840s felt this was overly brutal, degrading on the men being punished and wasn't uh, get, achieving any form of um, uh, reform. They wanted an alternative. The officers here wanted an alternative for a different reason. They realised that some men had developed a pain threshold so great they could take the lash without flinching. One man supposed to look over his shoulder, said to the man with the whip, come on, flagellate and do your pets. Who said that? William Derencourt sang a song. I don't know the tune, but the words were, If I had a little donkey and he wouldn't, wouldn't go, would I whip him, would I whip him? No, no, no. These men became heroes to the other convicts, men to be looked up to. Instead of it acting as a deterrent, we actually had men deliberately breaking the regulations. Knowing they'd be whipped in front of their peers, they could demonstrate how tough they were and get their admiration. I can think of better ways. That was the culture. So what do you use instead of physical punishment? The Quakers of Philadelphia felt that with the innate goodness of the human soul, if you gave a man enough time to consider his evil past and read his Bible, he would turn from sin and turn to God. And that was the basis behind Pentonville Prison, which opened in London in 1842. By 1849, operating on the same principles, the separate prison here in Port Arthur, forbidding looking brick and sandstone edifice, 
You come to Port Arthur and don't have a look inside, you missed the point. It's the basis of the modern British prison system. You get entry to fight the Western End. A couple of million dollars have been spent on re partial restoration and a lot of interpretation. Really. It was built initially as a, as a place of punishment, but then a change of policy saw all men coming into Port Arthur go straight in there for 4 to 12 months prior to coming out to workshops and work games. It was a silent prison. Communication between guards and guards and prisoners was by hand signal. Between prisoners, no opportunity given. Men were locked in single cells for 23 hours of the day with work to do. Boot making, brooms, baskets, tailoring, cleaning. End of the day, work check, sharp instruments taken away. After their evening meal, they were allowed two hours for contemplation and reading the Bible. For one hour a day, they went out for exercise. But before they left their cell, they had to put a mask on. It looked like this. Totally covered their face, just two slits for the eyes. So if they passed another convict in the corridor, no face, no voice, no recognition. The, uh, uh, an hour in the exercise yard and then back to their silent selves. Now that's what they did Monday to Saturday. Sundays they didn't have to work. They were expected to spend more time in reading and contemplation. Sunday morning and at least two, three other mornings of the week, religious and moral reform. They had to attend chapel. Masks on, they filed down the corridors to the central hall and into the south wing, the chapel. Even in there, they were kept separate. Consists of a series of tiered stalls, one man per stall. In his stall, he would not be able to see any other convict, only preacher and guards out the front. When everyone was in, the masks came off, and for the first time in a few days, he heard a human voice. Readings from the Bible, prayers, a sermon. But the part of the service they enjoyed most was the hymn singing. They nearly lifted the roof off the chapel when they sang. Service over, back to their silent selves. If you couldn't behave yourself in there, punish myself. One was still available. The walls are that thick. There was no window. There were four consecutive doors to get in. Inside, total darkness and total silence. He could be locked in in there anything from a few hours to 30 days. Though the records show few sentences exceeded two weeks. Excuse me. <coughs> now, <coughs> the, uh, uh, if you're there for more than two or three days, every third day you're taken out for an hour's exercise, usually at night. During that time, you had to empty and clean the sanitary bucket anyway. Not particularly good for your mental health. In fact, the social isolation of the separate prison hardly promoted positive mental health, and by the early 1860s, with a contribution from the pauper's mess, they felt they needed a lunatic asylum, so they started work on this building up here, the, uh, this big one. The transportation of convicts to Tasmania had actually stopped in 1853, so by the 1860s, the convict population down here was getting older. They didn't have enough able-bodied men to complete that building and they had to call a contract work gang in to finish it off. It's the only convict period building on site not totally built by convict labour. As a lunatic asylum, humane by English standards, the preferred method of treatment was to provide a calm and ordered environment to soothe the troubled mind. These days, as we look at it, the left-hand wing contains a museum, the central hall contains a continually running seven-minute video clip explains the history of the building. The right-hand wing contains the convict study centre. The shipping records there and books are also two computers that have got the name and record of around a thousand men known to have come through Port Arthur. So if you want to confirm your suspicions, go and try your brother-in-law's surname, that film that ran off to your sister. The south wing contains a coffee shop that doesn't open on Saturdays in winter, and uh, during the summer it closes about 3.30. There are toilets out the back. From 1884 through to 1973, it was the seat of local government, the town hall. For fairly obvious reasons, we're not allowed to make jokes about the suitability of a lunatic asylum for that purpose. I started by telling you that Port Arthur was designed like a giant machine, and the effect of that machine on individuals depended very much on how they reacted to it. If they fought against it, they finished up crushed. Psychologically, certainly, physically, maybe. But if they took what it could offer, they could pick up a basic education learn a trade, so when they got their pardon and were released into the community, they became tradesmen who helped build the state. And somewhere across that spectrum you'd find all men that came through Port Arthur, and I'm going to finish with a thumbnail sketch of two. John Jones put to work in the Commandant's whaleboat gang. They had to pick up the Commandant each day, take him on a tour of the harbour, stop while he talked to the boys on Point Poor, bring him back in. One morning they forgot to pick him up. They forgot to stop at Point Poor too. Around four months later, these eight men in an open ten metre boat were recaptured near Eden on the shores of Twofold Bay on the south coast of New South Wales. 
They were charged with stealing government property and punished severely for their crime. John Jones got a life sentence of hard labour in heavy chains on Norfolk Island, where he stayed till they closed the place down and brought all the prisoners back to Port Arthur. He returned 53 years old. He'd been in the convict system for 40 years and most of that in chains. His legs were covered in ulcers. They put him over there with the paupers and invalids and that's where he stayed, 1877, when with the ageing population of convicts here, the output from the workshops had fallen right away. The government decided that as an industrial complex it was no longer economic and they closed it down. Convicts, paupers and lunatics were taken to institutions closer to Hobart and we lose John Jones's record at that stage. George Perryman came here and worked out fairly quickly that if you want to stay out of trouble, keep your mouth shut and do as you're told. I tell him it still works. Doing that, he worked his way up through the system until he became a Class 1 convict, a ticket of leave. He could leave Port Arthur, go back to Hobart and work for wages, on condition that he reported regularly to a police. It's very similar to the modern day parole system. Moving around working, he met a lovely lady called Mary. They got very friendly, so George did what an honourable ticket of leave man had to do. He wrote to the governor and asked permission to get married. The governor said yes. Mary obviously said yes. They were married in 1839. 1841, George had a wife. He had a daughter called Emily. And he received his pardon from the governor, just 12 years after his original 14-year sentence back in the UK. And the records tell us that George continued to work around Hobart for the next 15 years or so. Then he disappears. But the indications are that he went to Victoria to try his luck on the gold fields. I suppose we should hope that he had some. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy your time here in Port Arthur.